They are one of the few enduring entities in a time of turmoil and unprecedented change. Five generations of the royal family ruled over Britain and its colonies through the 20th century. I think there is something about the royal family that represents decency, that represents a way of life we all want to continue. Against a backdrop of wars, ethnic crises, scientific and technological advances, they have been a point of reference. Even though the royal family were the grandest of them all, they presented themselves as a, as a middle-class family, and you could be like them. But rather than observing from the sidelines, they have increasingly left the sanctuary of Buckingham Palace to be amongst their people. The Queen says herself that I have to be seen to be believed. While the idea of roving royals was well established by the time the Queen took the throne, she has spent more than 70 years traveling the globe to experience life in the often overlooked parts of the planet, along the way bearing witness to the metamorphosis of the modern world. This is a royal tour of the 20th century. As we navigated our way through the turmoil of the first half of the 20th century, the royal family had been a safe harbor, a beacon of hope, in a world awash with wars, depression, and ethnic cleansing. As they toured the Commonwealth and beyond, they attracted a level of devotion usually only associated with movie stars. I think the royal family do just historically have a huge glamour factor. Of course, the queen herself in the early days of her reign was this very beautiful and staggeringly glamorous figure. The crucial thing is, I think, to go out there and to, if not to meet the people, at least to be seen by the people. Because in that way, the fetish is presented to the people. The sacrament is there, it's to be seen. And the religious devotion is thus stoked up. The royal's unswerving adherence to traditions was the tonic many felt was needed in the 1960s, in the wake of great shifts in the social fabric of the Western world. Inspired by the music of Elvis and the Beatles, a new generation was free to express itself in a way its parents and grandparents had never dared to. The conflict in Vietnam continued to divide public opinion more so than any other war, and protests against America's involvement were both vocal and violent. On another continent, a separate war was as equally devastating for its people, yet attracted far less attention around the globe. Among its many claims to fame, Ethiopia was, and still is, the world's most populated landlocked country. In 1961, Emperor Haile Selassie dissolved a federation agreement with neighboring Eritrea, declaring the coastal country to now be a province of Ethiopia. The war was still in its early days when the Queen and Duke arrived for a week-long visit at the start of 1965. Historic in many ways, the Queen's visit to Ethiopia, the first British monarch ever to go there. The Queen's 65 visit to Ethiopia was another example of what could have gone wrong in these same years. We've got France breaking up with its empire in Africa in quite a bitter fashion. Uh, Ethiopia, of course, was an independent country. And you have the magic of Haile Selassie and the Queen, two ancient cultures coming together. Wonderful symbolism, really. Emperor Haile Selassie was actually one of the first state visitors to come to Britain. There were crowds and cheering all the way. Londoners turning out in large numbers to add their welcome to the Queen's guests. I think he was the second state visitor that the Queen had, on which occasion she made him a Knight of the Garter. And so she went back in 1965. Ethiopia had never been part of the Commonwealth, but that did not stop its people turning out en masse to welcome the foreign dignitaries. Progress was slow for the royal couple, as they traveled in a state coach drawn by six white horses, flanked by a hundred horsemen of the imperial bodyguard, each of which wore a heavy lion's mane helmet. The tour in one way was all about lions, of course. Haile Selassie greeted the royal couple with this wonderful lion's mane helmet. 
at his palace there were his pet lions waiting. During her eight-day stay, she doesn't get close enough to pet the palace lions, who are closely guarded. So there wasn't much doubt that she was being met by the Lion of Judea. But the Lion of Judea was subjugated to second place, especially in the preparations for this much-anticipated visit. The capital's daily newspaper for the first time instigated a women's page paying homage to the British monarch. By the mid-60s, the Queen is becoming a, an, an international media figure. She's not a stranger to the Ethiopians. This is the beginning, really, of her truly global status as a queen. In 1965, she was still a young woman and so still very sort of glamorous as a head of state and a great deal more glamorous than a lot of heads of state. So naturally, it would be a very popular visit. But the seemingly effortless diplomacy was the end result of months of meticulous planning by an army of staffers working behind the scenes. A royal tour is prepared like a military campaign, every detail discussed. A number of different bodies come together, first, you know, to discuss it in both in general and in particular, we're talking the royal household, government, security, the embassy from the country, maybe various, you know, charitable bodies involved. For several months, both Victorian and federal police have been involved in massive security arrangements leading up to the Queen's visit, there are recce's in which people will work out exactly which way a door opens, where a gangplank has to be, um, who's going to be lined up, where they are, and so forth. I mean, down to absolutely meticulous. And I must say, having been on a royal visit or two, one of the things that I learned was never, ever lean against anything, because invariably the wall had just been painted with white paint at that moment, and then you'd be in big trouble. Depending on which royal is travelling, they would normally be accompanied by private secretaries, press officers, a stylist, hairdressers, and an operations manager to ensure a mostly flawless visit. But even on a more practical level, there's things like, oh, designing the Queen's wardrobe. The Queen Mother, accompanied by Princess Margaret, talking with Britain's top fashion designers, including royal dressmaker Norman Hartnell. There's so much to think about. They need to have a number of outfits, not repeat outfits, or if they do repeat outfits, they're doing it for a particular effect. Because very often, the queen or one of the princesses will want to pay tribute to the host country. So you'll see the queen wearing a maple leaf brooch in Canada, Princess Diana wearing cherry blossom pink for Japan. You've got to think about the colours, about standing out and about reflecting the colours that are good in that country. The Queen always wears very bright colours, so she stands out in the crowd. Because the Queen, for one, is very much aware, I think, that people want to see a Queen. They want to see a bit of bling. And, of course, the royal family can do bling like nobody else. The relationship between England and the next port of call for the Queen and Duke had a complicated history. Twenty years after defeating Germany in World War II, the wounds were still war for many. Throughout the Six-Year War, the royals had played a vital role in boosting morale amongst the British. Sequel to the Big Blitz, the visit of their majesties, the King and Queen, to districts in East London, which suffered very severely. King George VI had even managed a secret mid-war visit to the Mediterranean, where fighting for control of the strategic waterway had been particularly fierce. He visited Malta, which was a great success. He visited North Africa, and he distributed honors and so on. And he even made Eisenhower laugh by saying that he was glad to hear that General Montgomery wasn't after his job. His Majesty, intent on seeing as much of the army as possible, wanted to express his own and the nation's gratitude and admiration for the job they've done. It was a reasonably successful, but the problem with King George VI was that he had all the charisma of a dish rag. He couldn't empathize, he couldn't emote, and also he was physically rather prone to illness and seasickness and um, didn't like flying and, and so on. So he wasn't a sort of heroic figure of the kind that Churchill was during the war. The planned tour of the Queen and Duke in the spring of 1965 
would be the first official royal visit by a British monarch in more than half a century. It was designed to help bridge the political chasm that had widened between the two nations. The Queen's uncle made an unsanctioned visit in 1937 as a Duke of Windsor. The Duke of Windsor in 1937 wanted to get back into the limelight, and in particular, he wanted his new wife, the Duchess of Windsor, formerly Mrs. Simpson, to be treated with the respect due to a royal. He had been mortified beyond words by the fact that his brother, the King George VI, had denied her the HRH, these magic initials, Her Royal Highness. Going to Germany would get her treated in royal fashion. He would climb back into the limelight, and he didn't have any objection to Hitler at all. This visit was uncharted territory for the British royals. There was no precedent for an abdicated sovereign to act on behalf of the current monarch. The king had hoped his brother would retreat to a quiet life in exile in France, but that was not to be the case. He had a meeting with Hitler, which was, which was relatively successful. He Heil Hitlered. He clicked his heels, which was rather old-fashioned as far as the Nazis were concerned. That was an old-fashioned sort of Kaiser thing to do. And he really felt he was re-establishing himself on the international scene, going back to the days when he'd been the, the, the Prince Imperial had gone round the world and been fated uh, by, by all and sundry. Hiles echo in their ears as they drive away to their hotel. The tour ended up being a political nightmare for the British royals and government, leading to suggestions that the former king was in fact a Nazi sympathizer. As a result, the Duke was reassigned from his role in the British Expeditionary Force in France to the Bahamas, where he would remain as governor for the duration of the war. He was a very dim character. He didn't realize what a monster Hitler was. I mean, this is the extraordinary thing. Years after the Holocaust, after the whole thing was well known, he said, I didn't think that Hitler was such a bad chap. Extraordinary intellectual and moral blinkers he wore. Princess Margaret was the first royal to venture back into Germany after the war, with two visits in the mid-1950s. When the Viking of the Queen's flight arrived at Bonn, there was a warm welcome awaiting Princess Margaret. A decade later, the Queen and Prince Philip's visit was less about control of the country and more about promoting positive public relations, and they were the ideal candidates for the job. In the words of President Lubke, we regard your visit as a sign of growing trust in our people. Both the monarch and her consort had strong family ties with Germany. Elizabeth's great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, married her cousin Albert, who was of German nobility. The young prince had studied at the University of Bonn before moving to Britain. At the turn of the 20th century, the royals were known as the House of Saxe, Coburg, Gotha. But anti-German sentiment in World War I convinced them to adopt the name Windsor, which is still in use today. People forget, perhaps, that the name House of Windsor is a made-up name. It's a brand name. The family decided they had to change their name. We would call it a rebranding exercise. It wasn't called in those days. They searched back in history, Tudor, Stuart, Plantagenet, should we have a double-barreled name? And then apparently, the private secretary of the time looked out of the window, saw the round tower of Windsor Castle, and said, let's call it Windsor, not a family name, town name. For Prince Philip, the ties were even greater. As a descendant of the House of Glücksburg, his family had strong links to the German establishment. When he married Princess Elizabeth, 1947, none of his sisters could attend the ceremony because they'd all been married to German princes who had been on the Nazi side in the war. This trip, however, was more about looking to the future than dwelling on the past. The visit to West Germany is a mark. The Queen is demonstrating to the world and to the British people and to the West in general that West German Federal Republic is a part of the Western Alliance, that the war has been forgotten insofar as this new Germany 
is a democratic, humane state. And of course, Germany at that time was very anxious to, as it were, be accepted back into the club of Europe, if you like. And so the Queen's visit, in a sense, did enhance that. How much has been done in the last 20 years, and nowhere more than in Berlin, to renew and repair the contact between our people that go so far back into the past? I believe they are now very strong. For the Germans, there was a fascination with the British royals that extended well beyond compensating for the absence of its own monarchy. The Germans actually loved the grandeur of the British royals. It's interesting, because 1965, here in England, the British press and public were almost beginning to feel that in changing times, the royals looked a little bit out of touch, a little bit, you know, old hat. But in Germany, they just loved that. To have met royalty in the person of such a queen amid such scenes of splendor must now be among their treasured memories. And for the queen herself, what more exciting memory than the great firework display a few days earlier, the night the Rhine caught fire. But it was impossible to ignore the divisive nature of the capital city. At the end of World War II, Germany had been divided into four sectors, administered by the main allied partners, the United States, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. Ideologically, the Soviet Union under Stalin sat poles apart from the three other victors and was far more interested in building up the power of the Eastern Bloc countries than in working with the Western alliance. A steady stream of people deserting East Germany for West Germany in the 1950s prompted the Soviets to build the 156-kilometer wall that would become the most visible part of the so-called Iron Curtain. For the Queen, it was impossible to visit Germany without acknowledging the battles that still lay ahead for some of its people. Nowhere is the tragedy of a divided world made more evident than in this city. She sees the Berlin Wall, which is symbolizes the partition of Europe and the forceful constraint of people uh, living within the communist area. She also visits Royal Air Force cemeteries, inspects German troops. This is a formal recognition that Germany has changed. Uh, it has changed politically, but also changed its inner nature. And the Germans were very appreciative. The visit was the most enormous success. I mean, the Queen made a great effort. She got her dress designer, Hardy Amis, to design this, you know, wonderful dress to match the sort of lovely pale blue interior of the building where she was appearing. The whole purpose of that visit was in the spirit of reconciliation. And it was quite interesting that the, the press, who usually were very sort of divided, actually all came together and said what a fantastic visit it had been, universally successful. The scene outside West Berlin's town hall. Acclamation for Elizabeth, as the crowd chants her name. Despite the excitement and joy the visit brought, the German people faced many challenging years ahead before they could welcome the royal couple back to a unified country. But Germany was not alone in its struggles. Israel had taken on Egypt, Syria, and Jordan in the Six-Day War, catching the Arab armies off guard to claim West Bank, Gaza, Sinai, and Golan Heights. There were military coups in Ghana and Greece. The Khmer Rouge began their brutal fight for control in Cambodia. And three American astronauts died when fire broke out on the Apollo 1 spacecraft during a launch rehearsal. But there were moments of celebration as well. South African surgeon Christian Bernard completed the first heart transplant, while Canada went on show to the world in its Expo 67. Sixty-two nations paid tribute to Canada's 100th birthday as Expo 67 opens in Montreal. They've all participated in this giant and ambitious project. The Queen and Duke arrived by the Royal Yacht Britannia to tour some of the 90 pavilions which were based around the theme, Man and His World. 
it is still considered to be the most successful expo of the 20th century, and many of its relics, such as the futuristic housing design, Habitat 67, are still in use more than half a century later. The Queen is aboard for a sightseeing trip on the overhead rail as it runs through much of the exhibition she could never have hoped to see otherwise. The royal couple's attendance was hardly surprising, considering the close relationship between Britain and Canada. The Queen has visited the North American country 22 times, making it her most regular port of call. I think there's two reasons for that. And one, ironically, is the fact that the connection with Canada has to be fought for a little bit, because, of course, Canada is a nation of two backgrounds and two languages. There's always been an awareness that the French-speaking Canada may not feel any particular reason for loyalty, enthusiasm for the British Crown. But at the same time, Canada has been our foothold in the American continent. They received overwhelming proof of the affection and loyalty of the younger generation of Canada. Thus started a tour which in every sense seems likely to prove historic. Ever since uh, the Queen Mother in 1939 uh, said, when asked, are you English or Scottish, I'm Canadian, there's very little doubt that there's been a very close relationship between the royal family and Canada. The 70s would prove to be a turbulent time for the British at home. Clashes between the IRA and Royal Ulster Constabulary became known as the Troubles and forced the United Kingdom to deploy 21,000 troops in Belfast. The situation is now so bad in some Catholic areas of Belfast that even scout cars and personnel carriers have to patrol in pairs. But there was unrest in other parts of the Commonwealth as well. Bangladesh declared itself separate from Pakistan, and Qatar claimed its independence. Closer to London, another royal family was in the spotlight. Margrethe II became the first Queen of Denmark in more than 500 years. But it was Britain's relationship with a different European power that was behind a visit by the Queen in 1972. England and France had a long history of intense rivalry. But by the start of the 20th century, the two former foes had reached a more comfortable coexistence. The links between France and Britain had been closer since the Entente Cordiale of 1904. Subsequently, of course, there was the First World War and the Second World War where we were allies and the liberation was followed by retrenchment of Britain and France's imperial powers and there was discussion of a possible link between France and Britain and nothing came of it. The Queen's visit at the beginning of a decade that was going to see all sorts of changes in the Anglo-French relationship smoothed the way. In those days, Britain wanted to be part of Europe, and resistance to the idea was coming from the other side of the Channel. For the Royal Party, a hectic five days ahead. With the European common market just around the corner, the tour should cement our trade and friendship even more. The election of Charles de Gaulle as French president in 1958 saw a cooling in relations as he actively campaigned to keep the British out of the newly formed European economic community, fearing they would dominate continental countries. But his successor, George Pompidou, was interested in a far more cordial relationship, so he invited the Queen and Duke to visit in 1972. The Queen made her first visit here 15 years ago. The royal visit is perhaps one of the most significant steps towards developing a lasting friendship between Britain and France. A royal tour very often uh, can be simply promoting goodwill, but in 1972 there was a specific purpose when the Queen visited Paris. The French President General de Gaulle had twice vetoed Britain's application to join the European Economic Community. President Pompidou, his successor, was well disposed, and Britain's Prime Minister, Edward Heath, was an ardent Europhile. A Europe without Britain, like a Britain without Europe, would be both weaker and less prosperous. 
Another vote was to be held later that year for Britain's entry into the EEC. And with French backing, they were finally welcomed into the fold. The Queen's visit was a very special link, not a royal endorsement. Equally, of course, there was some division as to whether or not Britain should or shouldn't join. But the Queen acts on advice of her ministers. The five-day tour in May was all about promoting the great connection between the two nations, including the shared elements of their history. A lightning visit to northern France ended the tour. Her main engagement was at the Commonwealth War Cemetery on the outskirts of the town. A very high percentage of the 11,000 remembered here died from the effects of gas. Public interest in the tour was strong, with large crowds gathering at all the best vantage spots. I think it would be a fair comment that the French people, indeed the people of most countries, have a great affection for the Queen, not just a matter of longevity, but the dignity and commitment that she's shown. It isn't always shared by their politicians, but then as a head of state, the Queen is above party politics, and that is an absolutely essential part of the royal role. It was a convivial visit, the official party very relaxed in each other's company. Although possibly, they were not on the same page when it came to matters of taste. It's always intriguing to see which gifts heads of state give each other. President Pompidou's gift to Prince Philip was a gigantic wine cooler shaped like a grasshopper. Something so huge and so horrible that you cannot imagine anyone aesthetically appreciating it. Paris, that city of enchantment, switches on and prepares to entertain her royal guests. The French government did hit the mark, however, when it arranged a performance from the highly skilled riders of the cavalry school, much to the delight of their horse-loving guests. But not all animal displays on the tour were received quite as enthusiastically. The Queen was said to be annoyed when the dogs belonging to the Duke and Duchess of Windsor jumped all over her during a private visit for afternoon tea. Elizabeth had come to see her dying uncle, who had chosen to live in exile in France with his wife, Wallace Simpson. He was her favorite uncle when she was a little girl, but when she was 10, there was the terrible betrayal of the abdication. That I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. The abdication crisis was the great royal trauma of the 20th century. It affected everybody who had anything to do with the royals, and it shaped the way that royalty behaved. Peoples steeped in the traditions of monarchy, bound by the most affectionate memory of King George and by devoted attachment to Queen Mary, inspired by a sincere admiration of King Edward himself and his public service, found themselves stunned by a conflict of sentiment. Elizabeth learnt about it in those days through her parents, through her bitter mother, disapproving grandmother, Queen Mary, who felt David, as they called him, had let the family down so badly. This lesson in loyalty and sacrifice as a sovereign is one that has underpinned the Queen's approach to her role all throughout her career. I think if you want to understand, for instance, the early days of Elizabeth's monarchy, of leaving her children behind for long periods of time, that is one of the legacies that duty meant that your personal inclinations had to be subordinated to the expectations of what your advisors told you was required of the monarch. The queen only had to look to her father for a role model in devotion to duty. A shy man who had grown up in the shadow of his gregarious older brother. He was forced to take up the mantle of monarchy when Edward VIII abdicated. When George VI inherited the throne at the end of 1936. He said the throne was tottering. He didn't know how he was going to save it. Well, he did it, actually. 
by going through the traditional motions, by basing himself on his father, by adhering rigidly to protocol and precedence and all the traditions of the past he embodied. I think it's almost impossible to overestimate the effect of the abdication crisis. It was a ghost that haunted the British monarchy from that day onwards and probably still does. The Duke settled in Paris, and only a few days before his death, members of the royal family visited him at his home in the Bois de Boulogne. Despite the royal rift, Prince Charles took leave from the Navy to join his parents to say a final farewell to the man who had given up his right to the throne to marry an American divorcee. The Queen Mother had never forgiven her brother-in-law, but her daughter Elizabeth II felt it was only fitting to pay her respects. She behaved with her normal total courtesy towards the Duke, and I like to think that he'd only had the job for a short time. But that was something they shared. So for all the family bitterness, there was a bond between those two people. The Duke passed away 10 days after the visit, and the final reconciliation smoothed the way for senior members of the royal family to attend his funeral. But there was a little comical relief at the end of the tour when an enthusiastic Frenchman scaled the anchor of the royal yacht Britannia. The police, red-faced over the failure of their security net, hauled him away. The Queen didn't see the incident. A few minutes later, she and Prince Philip came on deck to wave goodbye to France. This was one of the more extreme examples of breaches of etiquette towards the Queen. But there were often times on her overseas tours where people were unaccustomed to appropriate behaviour around the royals. The media have made up this word, protocol, without really knowing exactly what it means. A lot of it is common sense and decency. When addressing the Queen the first time you meet her, it is your majesty, and thereafter it's ma'am. Men don't have to bow, and when you bow, there is all this sort of thing of bending at the waist. No, you don't bend at the waist. You just drop your head from the neck. You don't have to do it if you don't feel comfortable. Ladies don't have to curtsy if you don't feel comfortable. You're not going to get shipped off to the Tower of London or have your head chopped off. It's just a matter of taste. But these physical faux pas were nothing compared to the nervous attempts at small talk with the monarch. The last time I was here, it was a glorious summer afternoon like this. Mm, Very good. Yes. And, uh... and this, also this misconception, you cannot speak to the Queen first. I mean, she will come up to you and ask you a question. And from then on, you can have a two-way conversation. People do get tongue-tied in her presence. I've seen at palace receptions, captains of industry in a group, and these people are, are dealing with multi-million pound deals on a weekly basis. And the queen enters their group, and it's probably all men. They forget what they've got to do. Etiquette aside, the early 70s were certainly a time of celebration for the royals. I must confess, my Lord Mayor, that it came as a bit of a surprise to realize that we had been married 25 years. The Queen and Prince Philip marked a quarter of a century of marriage, and a year later witnessed the wedding of Princess Anne to Captain Mark Phillips, a union that would last close to 20 years. The Queen visited Sydney for the highly anticipated opening of the Opera House, an iconic structure that took 14 years to complete at a cost of $102 million, a staggering 15 times over the original budget. This tour was a one-stop tour. The Queen needed to be there, but she only came for three and a half days. It was unheard of for the Queen to come for such a short amount of time. She was just gonna do the one thing, fly in, fly out. We've seen a bit more of that since then, but we certainly hadn't seen it prior to that. Politically, Britain was struggling during the 70s. A hung parliament forced a general election, ushering in the Labour government of Harold Wilson and the exit of Edward Heath. Around the same time, Australia was experiencing upheaval of its own. The government was facing a constitutional crisis that would embroil the Queen. Prime Minister Gough Whitlam failed to get his budget through the Senate. The Governor-General intervened sacking the nation's leader and replacing him with the opposition's Malcolm Fraser. 
Well, may we say, God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor General. Now, the Queen has said that she didn't know about it, and certainly there's a lot of record to say that she didn't know until the following morning. But the perception was that she did know. The perception was this constitutional monarch so far away from Australian shores was actually dabbling in our politics. The fact that a royal representative could exert control over the Australian parliament helped to fuel the Republican movement, a push that has never been successful despite a groundswell of support in many parts of the country. Ironically, there was no hint of a desire to break free from British rule when the Queen visited Hong Kong in 1975. Although the colony would eventually succeed where Australia failed, albeit with control ultimately passing to a different master. Hong Kong, about the island and part of what we called New Territories, was actually part of the British Empire. In 1898, amongst other political developments, this territory is uh, extended, it goes further into actually territory in the mainland, and this territory is called the New Territories, and it doesn't become a permanent part of the British Empire, it became a leased territory for 99 years. The one-time Chinese province was no stranger to royal tours hosting 17 regal visits in the 134 years since Britain had claimed it as its own. Queen Elizabeth II was the first reigning monarch to visit Hong Kong, as she did in, in 1975. The thing about Hong Kong was that its anomalous status, a borrowed place living on borrowed time, suited everybody. It suited the Chinese because Hong Kong was a huge money-making machine. Uh, it suited the British because they had this hangover, really, from, from the empire. It was an old-fashioned place. There was no sort of democracy. Commemorative stamps and coins were minted in preparation for the Queen's arrival, and threats of protest by the Revolutionary Marxist League never eventuated as the public threw its overwhelming support behind the visit. Official functions were dominated by cultural performances, as the country's colourful heritage was brought to the fore. But it was the staging of the inaugural Queen Elizabeth II Cup that won the most royal favour. The guests of honour among 40,000 who turned out at Happy Valley Racecourse to witness Nazacat's victory. The entire tour was declared a runaway success, a chance for the Queen to reassure the people of Hong Kong that it was business as usual despite the shadow that hung over them. Mao Zedong, it was said, could have taken Hong Kong with a telephone call, but he didn't do that, and he didn't stir up resistance to the British in Hong Kong. The status quo suited everybody, so all she was doing, really, was showing the flag and keeping the continuity going. She had no more role than that. But that in itself was quite important, because until the end, when the lease ran out in 1997, it suited everybody to allow this fantastic economic success to pull the whole of China up by its bootstraps economically. And it suited us to have this offshoot of Britain uh, on the coast of China. By the mid-1970s, America was also enjoying a period of great prosperity with the launch of the Apple Computer Company and the release of Star Wars the highest grossing film of its time. But at the same time, the entertainment world was mourning the loss of one of its stars. Singer Elvis Presley died from an apparent drug overdose. 75,000 fans lined the streets of Memphis for his funeral. The streets of Great Britain were being prepared for a far happier event. 1977 marked the Silver Jubilee of the Queen's ascension to the throne. The year-long celebration was a chance for the royal family to regain its standing with the public. London celebrates. This is a gala day for young and old. A once-in-a-lifetime spectacle not to be missed. The last jubilee 
during the reign of George V was out of most people's memory or seemed a sort of weird Victorian thing. Everybody knew Queen Victoria had endless jubilees, but people at that stage didn't feel the same about the Queen. The run-up to the jubilee, there was a lot of cold water being poured on the whole idea. But the antagonists had underestimated the pulling power of a parade especially one that honoured a royal who was recognised and revered around the world. St Paul's Cathedral, where many have waited stoically through a cold night for just this moment. One million people lined the streets of London on June the 6th to take in the spectacle of Jubilee Day, with a further 500 million watching the globally televised event. I remember just, you know, the the street where, where I lived in South London in 1977. Some busybodies in the street said, let's have a street party, and nobody was very keen about it. When it happened, and the chairs are out in the street, and the kegs of beer, and there's music playing, it all added up to a very potent mix, and difficult to put your finger on, but the crown and the woman who wore it became for that year, but then thereafter, the more potent symbols of what mattered in our lives. And the celebrations extended well beyond British soil. The Queen travelled to Germany to inspect the 3,000 British troops that were part of the NATO force. It was the largest parade ever staged by the army, and no doubt felt never-ending for Prince Philip, who saluted throughout. Most of the 25,000 spectators at Senelaga are soldiers of the Rhine army and their families. For all of them, it's a day to remember. Germany was one of 36 countries the Queen visited in 1977, in the hope of reigniting a similar level of royal fervor as experienced on her Commonwealth tour more than 20 years earlier. And so in that Jubilee year, there were two huge visits to Commonwealth chunks of territories. The spring saw the Pacific leg, if you like, Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Islands, with which the royal family have very warm connections. And the autumn saw Canada and the Caribbean Islands. Australia featured on the Silver Jubilee tour schedule, but there were fears the Queen would be given the cold shoulder by the public after her Governor General sacked Prime Minister Whitlam two years earlier. I think a lot of people were sort of expecting that she might get a reasonably rough reception and they must have been disappointed because there wasn't one. Australians yet again showed their infinite capacity to flock to the side of the British monarch. What do you think of the back. Queen today? Lovely. She's beautiful. Ever expect to meet the Queen in your lifetime? Oh, no, no. That was no. a surprise. <laughs> Very happy about it. There was a little bit of issue in a couple of places, but it wasn't really palpably not directed towards the Queen, but to some of the politicians who were accompanying her. There was the warm welcome that she has always known. I think if you look at the numbers on the streets, they tell a slightly different story. They weren't coming in quite as many as before. But not everywhere was so welcoming. The IRA tried to force the cancellation of a planned two-day tour of Northern Ireland by mounting a campaign of violence in the lead-up to the visit. But the controversies did little to mar the celebrations. The Queen's Silver Jubilee was a triumph of public relations. The Royal Party attends a Silver Jubilee Youth Festival in which 1,800 children from all over Northern Ireland take part. It was a reminder of the fact that, you know, the monarchy represents the community. The Jubilee was about celebrating 25 years of the Queen, but actually it was 25 years of royal and national progress. And there'd been catastrophes like Suez, but here we were 25 years afterwards. All those countries around the world, like Australia and New Zealand and so on, may have been a bit disenchanted with Britain, but they were still with us. The changing reality of the world around them was brought home two years later, when the IRA assassinated the Queen's cousin, Lord Mountbatten, and his 14-year-old grandson during a boating holiday in Northern Ireland. The royal family was devastated by the loss of someone so close. A man who had mentored Prince Charles and held many distinguished positions, including the last Viceroy of India, 
And in the midst of the Irish crisis, Margaret Thatcher became the first female Prime Minister of Britain. A woman who would become known as the Iron Lady due to her uncompromising approach to politics. Because their expenditure is profligate and they have little consideration for the pockets of their constituents. A lot of people will tell you that the Queen and Margaret Thatcher did not get on well. Um, I do not subscribe to this at all because, uh, first of all, the Queen is absolutely understands that she will work with the chosen representative, the elected representative of the people. James Callaghan, Labour Prime Minister before Margaret Thatcher, used to say that what the Queen offered was not necessarily friendship, but friendliness. She will support that Prime Minister very much. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And as America celebrated the election of movie star Ronald Reagan as its leader, the music world lost yet another star with the murder of John Lennon outside his apartment in New York. Ironically, it was out of respect for the world's most established Christian religion that saw the Queen abandon her usual dress standard on a state visit. Vatican protocol required the monarch to wear black for her private audience with the recently anointed Pope John Paul II. But the dress requirement didn't sit well with her grandmother, Queen Mary, who insisted on wearing white with a pearl choker when she visited the Vatican with her husband, King George V, in 1923. Over the centuries, Britain's had a very difficult relationship with the Catholic Church, but once again, we are in the area of conciliation. Pope John Paul II was known for his restorative approach in relation to other religions, and the meeting between the heads of the two churches was described as very warm and relaxed. If you like, you've got two people from what would once have been very different sides of a, a religious divide, both very concerned now that perhaps the different branches of the Christian faith should stand together. And one of the points that she made was that amongst her subjects, there were indeed four million Catholics. And she invited the Pope to come, and he came in 1982. And that was a very, very successful visit. I mean, you had uh, big scenes in Canterbury Cathedral when he and the Archbishop of Canterbury, they were sort of embracing each other like, like footballers. These men of many churches then performed the ritual of giving peace to one another. But politics in Italy were far more akin to a tragedy at the time of the monarch's visit. The country had voted in 39 governments in the 35 years since World War II and was between prime ministers at the time of the royal tour. It was left to 84-year-old President Alessandro Pettini to host the Queen at the Quirinale Palace in Rome for her four-day stay. His task was to walk the Queen towards the splendors of this most ornate of palaces. But he covered most of the very long red carpet before he realized he was on the wrong side of the Queen. So, with some agility, he changed places. While media interest in the visit was strong, the number of people lining the streets was low, as the country grappled with economic and industrial chaos. It was a stark contrast to the royal tour 19 years earlier, when the mood was far more buoyant and crowds much larger, as the Queen and Prince Philip traveled to the popular tourist spots, including Venice. Back then, there seemed to be a simple pleasure a palpable excitement in having the Queen come to visit. But over time, that interest would start to wane. Apart from a spike in popularity during the Silver Jubilee, the British royals held less of a fascination for people outside the United Kingdom as the 70s drew to a close. The monarchy has undergone huge ups and downs in popularity during the Queen's reign. She was greeted with huge enthusiasm at home and abroad as this massively glamorous young figure. But the 60s, 70s, 80s, that began to fade away a bit. In a rapidly modernizing world, the monarchy had increasingly appeared outdated and stuck in traditions that no longer seemed relevant. But as the focus shifted from the queen to the next generation of the family, a young, trendy commoner was about to reinvigorate interest and elevate the royals to cult status once again. <laughs> 